everyone, it's Emily and welcome back to Kids in the Kitchen. This is episode six of our eight part series to get you comfortable cooking in your own kitchen. Today we're here in the Sackville Public Library and we're actually making lentil tacos and blueberry grunts. So I ho hope you have all your ingredients ready to go and you're gonna cook along with me too. So as always, there's a lot of things to think about before you start cooking in the kitchen, like reading your recipe all the way through and also making sure that you have a parent or guardian nearby to help you with any dangerous things in the kitchen. So for example, using the oven or the stovetop or chopping uh, are all things that you'd want to make sure that your uh, grown up is nearby, just making sure everything goes smoothly. Also, when you're thinking about making this recipe, make sure you're not allergic to any of the ingredients. Today we're making really simple tacos. Uh, it has some lentils, and it has a red onion in there, some spices, so we have some garlic powder, some chili powder, so it's a mixture of a few different spices, some cumin, so cumin isn't really spicy, but it does have a ton of flavor, and it kind of gives it that flavor you're used to when you're eating tacos. A little bit of salt, we're gonna put in our mixture, and some ground black pepper and of course we're going to have it on some tortillas so I'm using whole grain tortillas today it has a little bit more fiber than the white tortillas um, which help you feel full for a little bit longer throughout the day and of course no taco is complete without having some delicious toppings so you can really customize this to whatever you have at home whatever you like right now we're going to be using some uh, iceberg lettuce some tomatoes and of course some cheese to top off our tacos. And also I'm gonna put a little salsa on my tacos. So depending on if you like spicy or not so spicy, you can choose on what kind of salsa you'd like to top your tacos off with. A lot of you might be wondering why we're using lentils instead of ground beef or chicken, like you probably have on a regular basis. And the reason is top, lentils are one of the healthiest things you can eat. Lentils are actually a pulse. So a pulse is a dry legume, such as chickpeas, lentils, even peas. And the reason they're so healthy is because they're really full of fiber. And fiber helps you feel full for a long time. They also have a lot of protein in them, and that's very healthy for you as well. And they are so affordable. So you can buy a can of beans or chickpeas at the grocery store for just a couple dollars versus how much you would spend on ground beef or chicken. So it's easier to keep in your cupboard for a long time and you don't have to worry about it going bad as quickly either. So there's a lot of great reasons we're using lentils today and I hope you try it out and I really hope you like it. So the first ingredient in our lentil filling is uh, red onions. So red onion, white onion, onion, and yellow onion are similar flavor, um, but we're just trying the red onion today because I find it gives it more of a pop to our lentil filling. So slicing this will be similar as I showed you in a previous episode where we're gonna cut it from root to tip and we're going to skin it and then just use our claw shape to slice and dice. So I'll give a little demonstration now. So it's always a good idea to keep your root end intact while you're slicing your onion. It helps keep everything together. And your tip you can cut off once you slice through um, your onion here. So of course use your claw shape when you're cutting. And then this makes it a lot easier to peel your onion once you cut it in half. So just give that a little peel and discard. And you can actually cut off the little hairy tip here, but make sure to keep your root. So we're gonna do a small dice on our onion because we want it to cook up really nice and smoothly with our lentil filling, so we won't even be able to tell it's there. It's gonna have the flavor, but we don't want necessarily the crunch or the appearance of having pieces of onion in our filling. So we're gonna do a few extra slices horizontally, so get your parent or guardian to help you with this. We're gonna do three slices almost all the way through to the root, using our claw shape to make sure we keep a good hold on our onion. And we're gonna turn it once towards ourselves with the root end facing away. And we're gonna do a few vertical slices as well. So about seven or eight slices, almost all the way through to the root. One more turn around, and using your claw, you can do very 
thin, small pieces of your onion. And once you get to the end, you notice it won't be as sliced up as in the beginning. So you can just go over it with your knife to make sure not to waste any of your onion. And if you notice some of the pieces aren't chopped as much as you hoped, you can go over it one more time with your knife and then you'll have nice even pieces of your chopped onion. We're gonna fry up our onions now. and In the meantime, we're going to chop up our lettuce and our tomatoes for the toppings. We're gonna shred our cheese and get everything ready for the rest of the filling. We'll add our spices after our onions get nice and brown. And also we're gonna add a little bit of water to our mixture uh, just to make it a little bit more like saucy, if that makes sense. So you'll see it all come together when we're done with the filling. The first thing I'm going to do is add about a tablespoon of oil, which is about the size of a toonie if you pour it in a cold pan. And we actually have our pan here on medium heat. I'm going to heat it up a little bit more to medium high and distribute the oil all throughout the pan. And then we're going to add our red onion. And give it a little bit of a stir. You might remember from a previous episode I gave a little bit of a chef tip that when you're cooking onions to help them caramelize or turn brown and golden and delicious you can put a sprinkle of salt it doesn't have to be very much but that helps draw the moisture out of the onion and helps it get that nice golden color you're looking for and that will just bring extra flavor into the recipe. Give it one more stir before we just let it hang out for about five to 10 minutes. If you're nervous about your onions burning, you can do it at a lower temperature, but if you're a pro in the kitchen, you can have it a little bit higher and just make sure to keep your eye on it and keep stirring. I always love to keep busy in the kitchen when things are cooking, so I have everything come together at the end. So while our onions are sauteing and becoming brown, I'm gonna show you how to shred some lettuce and how to chop up some tomato for our taco toppings. All right, we're gonna shred our iceberg lettuce. And iceberg is really nice if you like a crunch on top of your tacos, but you can of course use other lettuce like romaine, Bib lettuce, you can even use spinach if that's what you have. But like I said, I really love the crunch and juiciness of the iceberg lettuce. So I'm gonna show you how I shred up lettuce. So you'll notice that there's a big stem on the bottom of your iceberg lettuce. So in the restaurants and when chefs go to chop up their lettuce, what they'll actually do, and this is kind of fun, is give a good whack. <laughs> So that will actually break up the stem from inside the lettuce, so you can do it a couple times. And that actually just helps it come apart from the inside of your iceberg lettuce. So then you just take the tip of the knife and with the guidance of your grown-up, just cut the inside out of the iceberg lettuce and it will come out so cleanly since you gave it that little whack, just like that. So the reason we don't really like to put this in our tacos is because it's a little tough um, and we don't want to have to chew and chew and chew. So we don't want the stem when we're chopping up our lettuce. Next, we're not gonna need the whole head. We can save this for a salad, for another meal, um, or anything you wanna put lettuce on top. So I'm just gonna put half a side. And then you'll notice there's a few leaves on the outside that might not look up to par, so you can take those off as well. I already gave my head of lettuce a really nice wash, so you wanna make sure you're washing all of your fruits and vegetables really well under cool running water just to get any dirt or any kind of bacteria or anything like that off the surface before you chop it, so make sure to remember that as well. And then with my sharp knife, really I'm just gonna start shredding our lettuce into very thin strips. So the thinner the strips, uh, the easier it's going to be to top your tacos with the lettuce. So practice makes perfect, just keep trying. And every time you're gonna get a little bit better at it. If you have some more big pieces left over, you can just go over with your large knife and make sure it's nice and shredded. 
And if you want it in even smaller pieces, you can just do a few rough chops to get it nice and small, and then just scoop it right into a bowl so you're ready to put it on your dinner table and serve it to your family. And there's our shredded lettuce, ready to go. So always remember to clean up as you go. That's really important as well. And of course, remember that your onions are cooking on the stove. So give them another little stir. If they're getting dark a little too quickly, you can always turn your stove down. But they're starting to look translucent. So that's about halfway to caramelized. So you can see they're nice and shiny and you can almost start seeing through them. That's what translucent means and that means we're getting there. All right, next thing I'm gonna chop up is our tomatoes. Tomatoes give tacos a really fresh, zesty flavor when you top them on top of our lentil filling. So we're gonna cut them into small, bite-sized pieces and we're just gonna set them aside for our taco assembly. Ta tomatoes are actually really easy to chop up. All you have to do is make sure you wash it nicely and uh, slice right through from the bottom, the top to the bottom. And depending on how experienced you are in the kitchen, just move that aside, uh, you can either stack it up in multiple layers to chop all together, or you can do one at a time. So practice this at home and you'll get better and better. You'll notice there's a little stem on your tomato. I like to just cut that out so I don't have anything tough to chew on uh, when eating the tacos. So just bite-sized pieces is fine. like that. And a sharp knife is really important for cutting tomatoes. Sometimes it's hard to cut through the skin if your knife is dull. All right, so there's our chopped tomato and usually it's about one tomato per person. So if you have a family of four, you'd want to chop up four small tomatoes. Family of six, you'd want six and etc. So I'm going to do that right now and finish that up. Remember to keep your grip solid on your knife. Wrap your hand all the way around and keep your index finger um, tight onto the knife so that you have lots of control while you're chopping. And also remember your wave motion. So if you wave your knife, you know that it's always touching the board. It will, it's less likely your knife will wiggle and that you might cut yourself. So the more control you have over your knife, the better. All right. If you feel like maybe your tomatoes are too chunky, you can always run through with your knife one or two more times, cutting any big pieces up a little smaller. And that's our end product, our chopped tomatoes. They're ready to be uh, topped on top of our tacos. So I'm gonna put those aside. And of course, we're gonna check our onions again. So you'll notice that they're starting to get a little bit golden on the edges. So we know we're really close. It's only gonna take a couple more minutes for these to get really nice and golden brown. If you notice that your onions are burning a little bit and you think you need more oil, try a little bit of water first and that might be what you need. But if it still seems to be sticking, you can add a little extra oil. And the last topping that we're gonna prepare for our tacos while our onions finish up is some shredded cheese. So it's actually a lot cheaper to buy cheese in block form and shred it yourself rather than buying pre-shredded shredded cheese. So I always like to do it that way. Um, but if you do have shredded cheese at home, of course you can use that too. I have the special shredder I got from Ikea actually um, for very cheap. It was about three or four dollars and it is a lifesaver because it actually collects all of the cheese right underneath the grater. So I highly recommend this. Um, but any cheese grater is absolutely fine. And even if you don't have a cheese grater, you can chop up the cheese really, really small and the end result is still gonna be delicious tacos. So whatever you have at home is what you should be using. Mm. 
Make sure to have your parent or guardian nearby while you're shredding the cheese. It is possible to get your fingers caught on the shredder and you wanna make sure that you have someone nearby that has a little more experience with the cheese grater and can help show you how to hold the cheese so you can prevent that from happening. I love cheese on my tacos, so I like to have at least half a block for a family of four. And you can always shred more if you need it. When you get to the end of your cheese, you might notice it's a little harder to shred. Um, so I just like to do little bits at a time and if you have to leave a few behind or munch them down, that's fine too. It's your little treat for doing all the cooking. So that's something I do at home. But today, I'll just add it to our pile. I like to use shredded cheddar. I find it has a sharper flavor on our tacos, so that's what we're looking for. And that is our shredded cheese ready to go. Put that aside and do a little clean up here. onions are almost completely done as you can tell they are so golden brown sweet and caramelized and the smell in the kitchen is amazing so this is a great thing to make if you have guests coming over because they're gonna walk through your front door and know you're cooking up something delicious right away we're gonna add our spices next and we're actually using a uh, garlic powder instead of chopped garlic today I wanted to show you that you can use both in a recipe and it's gonna have a similar result. So if you don't wanna to have to chop a bunch of garlic up, garlic powder tastes very similar. And you wanna make sure that you're using garlic powder instead of garlic salt, because that way you can't really control how much salt you're putting in your filling. But this way, you can just put in a dash at the end as much as you need, and that's how much you will uh, put in at the end. So we're just going to put about one teaspoon of the garlic powder, sprinkle it on top of our onions, We'll use about one teaspoon of cumin powder, which gives it that kind of Mexican taco flavor that you're probably craving right now. And depending on how much you like spice, you can add one or two tablespoons of chili powder. I really like spicy, so I'm gonna add two. And something great about spice is that the more that you eat spicy food, the more used to spice you'll get. So when I first started eating spicy, I could only handle a little bit, but now I can eat it every day and I'd be so happy. You wanna give your spices a little toast and you'll start to smell them right away because when your spices toast, that's actually when the flavor becomes really alive and delicious. Once you have that fragrant spicy smell, you're gonna add your lentils. I rinse these really well out of the can to make sure we get rid of any of the lentil water. And we're gonna add it right to our pan, just like that. And give that a great stir around. Mix all those spices and onions up with your lentils. any salt and pepper just yet. I'm going to wait until the end to see if it has the right amount of spice and if it's salty enough. And then I can add a little bit more if it needs it. If you notice on the recipe, it says to taste. And some recipes do call for salt and pepper to taste. So that just means if you like spicy or salty food, you can add a little bit extra. But if you don't, you don't have to. It's really up to you. We're gonna stir this so it all comes together and the flavors really meld together. And to make sure that it becomes kind of saucy and what you would usually expect with a taco filling, we're gonna add some water. We'll keep cooking this on low 
And if you remember from our chili recipe, the longer you cook your pulses in your flavored sauce, like a chili sauce or this sauce uh, for our taco mix, the more the flavor will actually absorb into the beans or the lentils that you're using. So patience is definitely a benefit uh, in this recipe too. And that's what your taco filling should look like. Just leave it to simmer for five to 10 minutes on medium or low heat, and then it will be ready to put onto your tacos. Now that we have everything ready, we're about to build our tacos. I actually added a little bit more water to our taco filling. As you can see, it came all together nicely, and it almost looks like ground beef. It's really similar appearance to regular taco filling. And I did add a little bit more salt and a little bit of pepper to my taste. But like I said, if you like spicy or if you don't like spicy, you can decide if you want to do that. Also, if you don't want to add more salt, but you want a little bit more kick of flavor, you can always add more chili powder or maybe even a little squirt of lemon juice. And that will bring out the flavors that's already in our recipe. So these are ways to reduce how much salt you're eating in a day. To build the tacos, all you need to do is set out your tortillas. I usually have two for a meal. It's really filling. And all you have to do is scoop your filling into the middle of your tacos. I would say about a quarter cup, but it's completely up to you how much you want to fill. And next I'm just going to put the topping. On our tacos so we have our beautiful lettuce I'm gonna put that first give it some nice crunch some of our tomatoes We can't forget our cheese, my favorite ingredient. Make sure to save some for the rest of your family. And there's our beautiful, colorful tacos. And optionally, if you want a little bit more zest to your taco, add a little bit of salsa right to the top. Something you could even try on these tacos is our fruit salsa we made in our pancake episode, if you're feeling adventurous. And how I like to do it is just rolling up our tacos by folding over one half and squeezing it together so it makes a nice round taco. Just like that. And if you want it to stay together, you can kind of hold them against each other and there's our complete tacos, ready to eat. For dessert today, we're going to be making a Nova Scotian traditional classic called Blueberry Grunt. So Blueberry Grunt is a really nice treat to have and it's actually pretty quick to whip up. You don't need to turn on your oven if it's a hot summer day. All you need to do is have a frying pan and have a bowl to mix all your dry ingredients to make your dumplings. So the reason it's called blueberry grunt is because first you'll start with your blueberry jam base, which is just four cups of blueberries, a cup of sugar, half a cup of water, and a little bit of lemon juice and cinnamon powder to give it a little bit boost of flavor. And that's gonna all cook together and get really jammy, really sweet and delicious. While that's cooking down and making your blueberry jam, we're gonna make the dumplings. The dumplings are really easy to make as well. All you have to do is mix your flour and your sugar, uh, a little bit of baking powder and salt together in a bowl. Then you're going to add your butter and just rub between your fingers so it gets crumbly and kind of looks like sand. And then we're gonna add our milk in to make a nice dumpling dough. So we're gonna get really messy today and our hands, make sure to wash them up really well. Um, because we are going to actually get, be getting really messy and getting our hands in there. So you want to make sure before you start, you get your hands nice and clean. 
Um, so when we make our dumpling dough, we're going to drop it on our blueberry filling, which is something you should definitely get your parents to help you out with, um, anything on the stove. And then we're going to cover it with a lid. And the reason it's called blueberry grunt is because some people say you can hear the dumplings grunting while the jam steams them and cooks them. I've never heard the grunting, but maybe if you listen close enough, you'll be able to hear it. So I'm going to get started by turning on uh, the stove here. So I have my pan here on medium heat, and I'm gonna go ahead and add my blueberries right into the pan. You can either use fresh or frozen blueberries. It really doesn't matter, but frozen blueberries are less expensive, so I like to use frozen. And I also noticed that frozen blueberries cook a little bit faster and get a more rich purple color and get really jammy and sweet. So I recommend frozen. These ones were frozen and thawed out a little bit, so you can leave them on the counter uh, for a couple hours for them to thaw, and then just dump them right in your pan. Next, I'm gonna add some sugar. So it's dessert, of course it has some sugar in it. So we're gonna put uh, about a cup of sugar in with our blueberries and give it a nice stir. And you'll see the sugar really absorbs some of that juice from the blueberries. But as the blueberries cook, they'll kind of release their juices and create that nice blueberry jam. I'm going to add some water. The water helps the cooking process. And of course, lemon juice to give it a little bit of a sour taste. It's going to be a very sweet jam. So putting some lemon juice will help give it a nice balance of flavor. And our cinnamon. So cinnamon is kind of the secret ingredient in blueberry grunt. It makes it smell so good while it's cooking and it also gives it kind of a cozy um, autumn taste, like a pumpkin spice pie or something like that. So we're gonna give it a stir through and just let it do its thing on the stove top until it is jammy. So that means that it's sticky and when you pull your spoon through the mixture, it kind of sticks to itself. It doesn't just keep running uh, with the juices right back into the pan. So be patient, let it do its thing, and you'll start smelling it pretty soon. So while our blueberries are getting nice and jammy and delicious, we're gonna make our dumpling dough. And the dumpling dough will actually absorb some of that jam when we put it on top to cook them. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with just some regular all-purpose flour, two cups, right into the bowl. We're gonna add our half cup of sugar, our salt, and our baking powder. So the reason that we put baking powder in our dumplings is because we want them to be a little bit poofy and soft. If we just put flour and milk and butter together, it would make a very tough kind of bread-like dough on top, but we want something soft, pillowy, and something that will kind of absorb the juice from the blueberries. So that's why we're doing that. And next I'm just going to show you how to break the butter up into the flour. All right, so we can just put our butter right into our flour mixture. I like to cut my butter up into small pieces before adding it to the flour. That way it's easier to break it up with your hands. And this is about two tablespoons of butter. So I'm just going to dump that right in. And first with my hands, that make sure they're nice and clean, I'm just gonna get some flour on them. So I'm gonna mix in the sugar and the baking powder without touching the butter at first. And then what I'm gonna do is start coating the butter with the flour so it doesn't get too sticky. So once that is nice and dry, you can use your thumb and your forefinger to squeeze the butter. So you want it to be about the shape and size of a quarter. And the reason we're doing this is because we want our dumplings to be flaky. And so if the butter is nice and flat, it will melt in the dough while it's cooking and create some nice flakes in the, in the dumplings. So just keep doing that and mixing it together with your hands. You don't want to over mix your dough because then it will become a little bit tough and not flaky and not poofy like what we're going for. You can see our jam is bubbling away. As long as you keep an eye on it, you can put it a little bit higher temperature on your stove top. Make sure your parents are close by and will help you stir it around and, and to use the stove if you're uh, not able to do that yet. 
All right, so now you can see the flour actually looks kind of like sand. The butter's kind of mushed into the flour, but it's still in nice chunk sizes like this. So once it looks like that, just stop and add your milk. And the way I like to do this is make a little bit of a well in the center of the flour where you can pour in your milk. And then we're gonna get really messy. So with your same fingers, just bring it together, mix together, and you're gonna start forming a dough. It's fun to get messy in the kitchen, and it's okay, because you can always wash your hands later. So as long as your hands are clean when you start, don't worry about getting them dirty. All right, so I'm gonna scoop this dough off of my hands and give a quick wash, and then I'll use a spoon just to completely incorporate all the flour with the uh, wet dumpling pieces. So I'll be right back after I wash up. So make sure that you actually are stirring your jam a little bit so that it doesn't burn, but it does, it is able to bubble for quite a while before that's a problem. So just give it a quick stir. You'll probably smell that cinnamon pretty strongly at this point. And over here with the dumplings, I'm going to take my spoon and just make sure every little dry bit of flour around the edge is incorporated in. But again, I don't want to overwork the dough. I don't want it to be tough. So don't do this too many times. I would say just make sure that all the flour on the outside is incorporated. And after your dough is all together, we're going to get a little messy again. Um, we're going to take our hands and form golf ball sized balls of our dough and once the jam is right nice and thick and sweet we're going to drop that right on the top cover our pan and just let it cook you can make your dumplings by just pinching off about this much dough about the size of a golf ball and just lightly rolling between your hands and setting it aside in your bowl they don't have to be perfect they definitely won't look perfect after they're cooked but they'll taste amazing. So don't worry too much about them being perfectly round. As long as they're in about the size of a shape, then that's perfect. I would say this much dough will make maybe 10 dumplings and about two dumplings per serving. So that's really great for a family of five and everybody gets a taste of your delicious recipe. They're gonna be so impressed with you that you made this. All right, so now we have all of our dumplings formed in our bowl, that's kind of what it looks like. And I'll just drop them right on here in a couple minutes when we're ready to steam them. So the reason we love to cook with blueberries in Nova Scotia is because we grow a lot of blueberries here. So it's really important when you're choosing what foods to eat to think about what grows in Nova Scotia. It's really great to buy from our farmers that live close by to us because if we support them, they'll be able to do well and provide food for us in the future. So for example, in Oxford, Nova Scotia, we grow tons of blueberries. So if you support local and buy uh, Oxford blueberries, the, the farmers will be able to keep doing what they do and we'll be able to keep enjoying our Nova Scotian fruits and vegetables. So as you can see, it's starting to get really shiny, really sticky looking. It just needs a few more minutes before it forms that thick jam. So think of strawberry jam that you put on your toast in the morning. That's kind of what we're looking for in the pan. And it's such a beautiful purple. Look at that. Something that'll stain your lips. So you'll notice it's quite a bit thicker now. It's not liquidy anymore. It's more of like a jam. So when I pull my spoon across, it separates for a few quick seconds before coming together. But if I was to do that with just the juice, it wouldn't really separate at all. So this is pretty much what you want it to look like before you add your dumplings. And it will continue to thicken as you steam your dumplings too. So I'm gonna turn the heat down to medium. And I'm gonna add in my dumplings right on top of our beautiful jam. 
Make sure your parents help you with this because if you splash any blueberries on your fingers while you're dropping in the dumplings, it's gonna really hurt. So you wanna be extra careful when you do this part. And you should be able to fit all your dumplings on top. It's okay if you still see the blueberries. That's part of the beauty of this dessert. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's going to look beautiful no matter what you do. All right, so I'm gonna take out my spoon, set that aside, and we're gonna take our lid, pop it on top, and just let it steam and do its thing for about 10 minutes. And the way that we're gonna know that the dumplings are done is when we lift up the lid and poke them with a fork or a knife, it's not going to be very soft at all. So when we're all done and the jam is all absorbed into those dumplings, we can serve a bowl and enjoy it together. So come back in a couple minutes and we'll be ready. All right, let's take a look and see if our dumplings are done. I'm just going to remove the lid and I can smell the cinnamon. I can smell the blueberries. It smells really good. And if you take your spoon and poke your dumplings, nothing sticky. They're soft, but they're not mushy, <laughs> like raw dough. So I'm gonna go ahead and try one. So all you do is take your spoon, scoop out a delicious dumpling, and put it in your bowl. That's, that's what it will look like. And always remember to add a little bit of extra sauce into your blueberry dumpling bowl because you want to have a bite of sauce with every bite of dumpling. So I'm going to let it cool for just a minute and then I'm going to dig in. I hope you cooked along with us today and you had a lot of fun. I hope your dumplings turned out as good as mine look anyway. Thank you so much for joining us for In the Kitchen with Halifax Public Libraries and we'll see you next time.